you know, well-being is at the heart of uh, driving performance. Uh, performance uh, and well-being are inextricably linked. And in organisation, we don't emphasise that sense of well-being enough in context of then driving performance. We sort of just feel like we'll just push through, we'll just grind it out, we'll just you know keep going. You do have to grind through sometimes. But I think as a business leader, trying to create the, the conditions where well-being is is discussed, where it's aspired to, where we are there more often, is very much tied to performance. And and so driving that linkage and creating that linkage in people's minds more often, I think is something I've learned over the last couple of years. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to another episode of the Finding Equilibrium show. I'm Warren Smithchill, and I'm delighted that you're here. And of course, delighted to that my guest today is Stephen Worrell. If you're not familiar with his work, Stephen is the managing director of the Microsoft business here in Australia and across New Zealand. It's a role he's occupied since 2017, I think. And but our paths have crossed really through the work uh, that we both do in this area of well-being at work. Stephen is a very passionate advocate for diversity, inclusion, uh, and well-being in the workplace, particularly mental health. So I'm delighted that Stephen has made some time today to be with us. Um, Stephen, I know you're extraordinarily busy, so I'm really happy to see you and welcome you back to the show. We had a conversation, it must be two, three years ago now, and it feels like the world has really um, moved on significantly since that that period um, and I'll put the link to that episode because in that episode we talked a lot about your own personal background and, and your own journey. Today I'm really keen to sort of jump in and really talk about how we create people-centered organizations and just to set the scene how many people are you responsible for or have influence over in, um, in the work that you do? Mm, um, I'm great to be here Lawrence and thank you for the invitation to join and Thank you for the continued work that you do in such an important area. Uh, well, look, uh, in Microsoft, in Australia and New Zealand, there's about 3,000 people, I would say, in uh, in the country. Um, about 1,000 of them work within the sort of sales and marketing organisation, and then we have um, engineering and other, other divisions. And so that's one answer to the question. But, but of course, you know, in leadership roles, you... You, uh, the impact you have um, sometimes goes goes beyond the standard boundaries that you might define. And um, I think that's part of the conversation we want to have today is how do you um, think about your role and, and influence and how do you think about uh, impact well beyond what the normal boundaries might look like? A hundred percent. So the, the, so when you think about well-being and being a priority, what, what does that mean to you? So if, um, if um, boards and, um, and uh, leadership roles are really prioritizing well-being how does that how does that show up how do you experience it yeah well, look it's um i'm glad to be connected again because so much has changed since we last spoke and i've also learned so much and continue to learn in this space because of the work we do with the alliance and so maybe a couple of quick thoughts well, one is that the conversation around um, mental health well-being sometimes is mis, um, misrepresented or misunderstood and that is that it becomes um, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, a conversation about, well, yes, of course, that's a, that'd be a nice to have and something that we should aspire to, but not as um, hardcore as you might say, delivering the budget or delivering the profit for a business, right? Those very, very hardcore business measures. And so what I've, what I've been um, fascinated by and learning and continuing to, to evolve our thinking in the Alliance is about how do we um, continue to refine this conversation because my answer to your question is, you know, well-being is at the heart of uh, driving performance. Um, it's, it's fascinating, you know, today we're talking during the Olympics. Uh, you don't have to look too far to see uh, and hear so many stories from athletes who, those that have, you know, climbed onto the podium and, and won a gold medal or any medal, um, many of them, if not all, talk about uh, being at their best and, and they talk about their discipline, whatever way um, they go about preparing themselves. But at, at, at the core is this sense of, you know, they want to be, uh, they want to feel well and be be well so that they can perform well. And it sounds like the most obvious and trite thing to say, but performance uh, and well-being are inextricably linked. And in organisations, I think over a long period of time, having worked in, you know, in business for a few years, um, 
we don't emphasize that sense of well-being enough in context of then driving performance we sort of just feel like we'll just push through we'll just grind it out we'll just you know keep going and there are times when in life you have to right i mean life isn't easy uh, uh, many times like you just see you just you do have to grind through sometimes but i think as a business leader trying to create the, the conditions where well-being is is discussed where it's aspired to where we are there more often is very much tied to performance and and so driving that linkage and creating that linkage in people's minds more often i think is something i've learned over the last couple of years how do you do it? I'm curious how you would do that in your role um, and within the culture, because I completely agree that in sports, um, there is a direct link. People can see because it's your, your, your product is your body, if you like. So if you're not looking after the impact your performance, it's very obvious. But when you put it into more of an engineering role or a corporate yeah. role, it can easily be hidden behind. And I feel that this is one of the blockers in terms of really um, this kind of intangible nature of well-being. It isn't as easy to measure um, as um uh, as finances or some of the other yes. some of the other yes. metrics and so i'm curious how you do that um and how and how it shows up and perhaps what metrics you would mm. love to see measured whether you're already measuring them or or which metrics would really um uh, turn the needle you bet first quick thought is um while athletes are very much engaged in physical pursuits the different sports they, they um, participate in um, most is not all uh, also talk deeply about the connection between the mind and the body and the mental fortitude strength process that they go through to focus to be present because there are so many stories we've seen over the last couple of weeks in the olympics of great athletes who didn't quite perform on the day and, and in many cases it might have been an injury but in many cases um, they reflect on you know they, they, they weren't focused they weren't still they weren't calm they weren't able to bring bring their best and so there's this duality that uh, you know has been talked about for hundreds and thousands of years that we have to observe and acknowledge as well um, but to your question what what do i try to do i mean i think it starts with the uh, leadership has a role to play because if this isn't a conversation that's being had inside an organization then i think it's pretty difficult for well-being to be at the heart of then how that business might aspire to um to focus its efforts and so uh, i think there's a role for leadership here um, and so the leader has to have you know it doesn't have to have but could have a point of view on this topic that, that then then informs the discussion in my case um, uh, we, we, clearly it is an important topic and i do talk to my team about it often and what I've, I've learned, Lawrence, is that by opening the conversation up, I think you create more space for then uh, people to bring their own version of this to the to the workforce. That there are some, uh, maybe my heritage, who a bit more of the you know performance starts where well-being ends. Right, I go back to my early days when I uh, you know started in work. That was a bit of the mm, narrative back me then. Me too. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And then many people can relate to that mm. um, that thought. And then and there's a massive spectrum, right? Because there are so many different um, people, of course, but generational differences in the workforce today mm. who have a very, very different view on on that. And especially after COVID, because that sort of changed everyone's point of view about their relationship with work. And so it's a long answer to your short question, but I think leadership is key. You've got to have a point of view and um, it doesn't matter what that point of view is in one sense, if you've just got to have it because that will inform the conversation that occurs. Uh, and in my case with my team, it has proven to be important in having the conversation because it's opened up all sorts of things. And, you know, we've, we've been, as a result of that, have led into conversations about intersectionality in the workforce, about racism, about bullying, about sexism, many, many actually quite challenging and difficult topics. But by opening up the space, um, I'm very confident that we are better for it, as uncomfortable as some of those conversations have been. Mm. Uh, because ultimately well-being you, you what you're driving towards um, is a term that you and i've talked about before this idea of psychological safety so that for people to feel well they have to be they have to feel safe and in a workplace oh my gosh um you know that's the last place people feel safe in many in many regards right and so how do you create uh, safety so that when you have a conversation about well-being you know people know that you're being authentic Yes, no, 100%. And just kind of picking up on that authentic, and uh, you, you said something about 
creating the space to have those conversations. I'm, I'm curious and interested in how you do that. Like, are you training your leaders and managers to be able to have these authentic conversations? Completely, you know, completely agree with that. Or are there forums which allow those conversations to um, to take place? It's a, it's a, that and, you know, all of the above. So we, like most organisations, have a diversity and, in, and inclusion um, policy, procedure, protocol, um, including events, including moments, including um, sessions, right? Uh, we leverage those. We, we have employee resource groups where we say to our teams, you know, feel free to aggregate around areas of interest. And, you know, we have a, a, an Asians at Microsoft group. We have uh, our Glean group representing the LGBTI um, a community. We have a group that focuses on Indigenous uh, issues. And so they're all voluntary, where your teams aggregate around these issues. Um, we also then create moments um, uh, uh, for deep, deeper conversations where we'll invite experts from outside, which is really important to just give you a um, get your head out of what's happening in your business and get people in from outside to help you understand a broader perspective. And those conversations, I, I have to tell you, they've been. Um, we had one on mental health just recently, really painful because a lot of it digs up a lot for people, right? When when they feel like there's a safe space to have the conversation, guess what? Some of these conversations are really hard. Um, and so uh, I'm not I'm not suggesting for a second that this is all um, simple or that it, it's straight line because it isn't. Uh, but I think what we've learned by creating the time and the space for these conversations, our teams feel that there is an opportunity for them to be more of themselves in the, in the workplace. And, you know, the pithy statement is, you know, be your best self. Um, it's a wonderful slogan, but ultimately what you're trying to do through wellbeing and through these conversations is help people to perhaps be more open and less guarded about trying to play a role at work uh, and to just be, be themselves, presumably then um, get closer to their best performance, which we see in our business, right? We see people who relax then and, and start to um, get, get into their state of flow, whatever that looks like for them. Um, and, you know, we see performance as a result. And so back to your first question, that's what I'm fascinated by is how do we do that more often and how do we create that straight line? Because that's where this conversation goes from um, people who are passionate about it to a core business metric, right? Because then... There's no debate. It's like, well, I want to drive the best performance in my business. Who doesn't? I have to do this because this is just as important as managing my P and L well. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I love, I love what you just said, and I just kind of want to underline that because, I guess what I what I heard you say is, we can talk about well being, and it can feel easy to do you know that's kind of where we've come from and that's why lots of the peripheral things you know it's easy to do pilates classes or some of those things but once you really start to go deeper that's when it gets harder you know when you start to have discussions about mental health then you are inviting people to really open up and that's a big topic and of course everyone's on their own journey and everyone's got their own story and you never know what's actually going to come to, to come through but what then i've see, i see this you know through the work that <clears throat> that i do what happens when you do invite people to do that and you create those safe spaces of course then mm -hmm. people feel a lot more connected and engaged mm -hmm. and supported which mm -hmm. then supports one of the metrics that every organization looks at which is retention you know because retention is a big indicator of um of a culture of well-being if people are, are sticking yes. around then that indicates they do that organization is doing something right if they're not sticking around or you've got a lot of um a lot of attrition particularly in the first year then that's often often a you know a red a red flag uh, that there's something that needs to be addressed at a cultural at a cultural yes. uh, level um thank you for sharing that just kind of moving the conversation on a little bit now and just thinking about the obstacles because i want to bring in because as well as your 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 role at microsoft and you've referred to it you're you're one of the founding chairs of the founding chair of the city mental health um alliance and um we spoke about this last time we we, we spoke and this is has really expanded over the last few few years i'd love you to just kind of share a little bit about what that is for people who are not familiar mm. um and then also and then i'll ask you another question question um, uh, once uh, once you set the scene yeah no problem the the, the mental health alliance is a collective of like-minded business leaders who come together to say 
we think we can learn from each other. We think none of us has um, the answer. Um, we think uh, we see in our businesses every single day the impacts of poor mental health and poor well-being. And we think as business leaders, we can we can be better. I mean, that's that's at its heart. That's what it's about. We're expert guided, but business led. So, admittedly, we we are mental mental health experts. Never never profess to be. Never never hope to be. We're business leaders, and we're simply saying that the workplace is a place where people spend a lot of time. And the extent to which we can create better environments, we can drive stronger performance. We can drive better attention. To your earlier thought. Um, and we can create uh, in the environments that more and more people will want to join, especially in the sorts of businesses that are, are trying to tap into the cognitive skills of of, uh, you know, of our of our teams. So that's that's the, the alliance. I mean, the, um, we, we are admittedly large in the town, so large corporates are the sort of the founding members. But our aspiration, Lawrence, as we've talked about, is to ensure that whatever we learn, whatever assets we have, whatever resources that, that we've proven work through our research and through our experience are made available to everyone. And there are 13 million Australians who got up this morning to go to work. Um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, as a nation, acknowledge and recognise that perhaps the single greatest driver of productivity for uh, our country is sitting right there in front of us. Um, it's, a, it's fascinating for me because I'm in the tech industry, right? And we, yes. we, we hyperventilate about how technology is going to save uh, save everyone because of the productivity benefits, especially now with generative AI. It's, it is exciting, I've, no doubt. And yet the Productivity Commission tell us that poor mental health and, and poor practices uh, cost the Australian economy, you know, tens of billions of dollars a year. And so I've always looked at that and thought, um, yes, of course, we'll use technology and we'll use whatever we can as a, as a country to drive productivity so that the next generation can enjoy the privilege that we have. But um, I look around me and think, oh, my gosh, what if we could we could address this issue, create better workplaces, create better, better, better organisations uh, where well-being is, is at front and centre in terms of performance? Oh, my gosh, there's a productivity lever, a massive one. <laughs> 100 percent, and i see that myself and that's what really drives you know a, a lot of the work that that i do but there's something and i feel we're kind of getting closer to really identifying what yeah. it is and the generational conversation that we, we we touched on before i think gives us clues because i'm seeing as generation z comes into the workplace they're seeing their parents who are kind of burning out and they don't necessarily want the same for themselves so we've got these kind of conflicts that are going on whereas if we can really address the core issue of creating work that actually supports mental health supports well-being then of course the productivity goes up and that's what every leader wants i'm curious when you when you wear the hat of the um the chair of the city mental health alliance i'm curious to understand what um what that group, because you're talking to a lot of um, senior leaders of very large employers, um, and they all are challenged with growth and with um, and with um, hitting um, expectations. Mm -hmm. When when you discuss this topic and the opportunity that it presents, what do you hear them say that is getting in the way? For uh, because it feels like. It's an opportunity, but it's it, it often ends up in the too hard to do uh, mm. desk, and then for, yep. therefore we focus on AI and the massive investments that are required there, mm. or we focus on some of the things that mm. are perhaps um, easier to implement, um, whereas the, um, the 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 mental well being or the emotional well being can feel too hard and therefore we we don't prioritize it and we don't get the benefits um, and we just keep spending the um it, because the costs are are getting clearer you know what the cost is of not actually um not actually focusing on this yeah i think it um a couple of thoughts i think it, it comes back to the leader's point of view in many regards not not the only factor but it's certainly a, a big factor uh, we know there is a massive connection between the workplace and our community. And so um, I, uh, in the Alliance, uh, the, the first group who, who uh, jumped straight in and said, yes, of course, I, I want to work here. Not surprisingly with those who had exposure to the outcomes, the, the poor mental health outcomes that they've seen either in their families, maybe personally, 
or in their communities. And the reality is, if you, given how much time we spend at work, it's such a big bearing on our community. And so this, this is why this is also really important. It isn't just about driving performance and, and having a strong economy, it's having a strong community. Because if you've got a great job and you're happy and it's a great place, and, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's generally um, an organization and an environment that looks after you, guess what? You're probably more likely, and we know this from research, to be um, happier in your day-to-day -day life. And the epidemic of poor mental health outcomes that we're seeing across the community um, uh, are very evident to business leaders as they are to all of us because we you, you, it's almost impossible to comprehend that anyone you talk to doesn't have some exposure in their circle to uh, poor mental health outcomes. And so when I zoom out, I'm incredibly positive and optimistic, Lawrence, about the work that you do and the work that others are doing in the mental health landscape because I just look at the progress that we've seen over the last, you know, my my working life. And maybe that's too slow, 30 years, okay? But it's massive, right, in terms of how this conversation is now front and centre. What needs to happen next, I think, is we need to continue the dialogue. And, and then, you know, for organisations where um, there isn't enough um, awareness or knowledge, acknowledge that's just the facts. Um, and, and, and then through the alliance, through your work, through this conversation, hopefully help uh, make available to more and more business leaders and more and more businesses the assets, the techniques, the, the approaches that you might use. And that's the, you know, the, the lofty ambition of the Alliance over time to impact 13 million working Australians in whatever way, might not be some minor way, but if there's something that CBA has done that's really, really useful in the financial services industry, and there's and there are massive things that they've done. Or in retail, Bunnings, Coles and Willys, they've been dealing with so many issues through the pandemic and today have developed deep competence in how they create better environments for their teams. How, how about we share that with every retailer in the country? Um, it's great for our economy and even better for our community. And um, it may not happen in, in our lifetime, Lawrence. I, I hope it will, but <laughs> <I do too. laughs> we're, we're making progress, right? And, yes. we're, and, and I'm very optimistic about where we're going because um, the next generation, of, as you said earlier, it's not an option for them. It's not like a, uh, this would be nice to have in my workplace. People vote with their feet. They're not going to work for organisations that don't have a point of view on this topic. Yes. No, I, I feel optimistic as, new, as the new generation comes through um, because they don't have to unlearn. I mean, what you said before is very true. You know, my generation um, have been brought up in a different way, you know, from a leadership point of view. And and uh, and, and the requirement is to unlearn some of those things that perhaps were, were, were believed to be true, at, and they were at the time. How would you describe your leadership style now? Like you, 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 you've been working for 30 years, you've done lots of things. I know you worked for a long time at IBM and now at Microsoft. So you've worked in big technology and you've seen the world really shift through technology um, and you've been leading large teams throughout that period and um, how would your leadership style now uh, that's an interesting question i um because yeah, because you um the first thought is you uh, how you see yourself is um always filtered and always imperfect um mm. given um uh, how how you show up to others so but look i think um, what I'd like to say in answer to that question is I, I'm just trying to be closer to um, who I actually am more and more because I've, I've played my role for 30 years um, and I still played my role. Um, and there are lots of roles to play, whether it's, you know, with government or with, you know, large clients, small clients, internally, um, as a, in my personal life, as a husband, as a, as a father. Um, I think what I'd, I'd, I'd say is I'm just trying to be more, more, more of who I actually am, as imperfect as that is in many cases. Uh, at least people know that um, I'm not bullshitting them. And I, I think as a, as a leader, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's just my point of view. Maybe that's what I look for in others um, because we all, we're all imperfect in so many different ways. And so there are challenges that come along that I handle well and many that I don't. And so stop stop trying to pretend that i'm i'm i can just skate through that just be open about you know my weaknesses or the things i don't do well and just you know be relaxed to say well um uh, you know either i'm apologizing because i didn't handle that well or or i might have handled something well and that's great but now i'm going to try and 
continue to evolve and improve and be closer to who I am? I think that's it's a long answer to your short question again, but I think that's sort of what I'm trying to get to. It's great. I mean, what I hear when you say that is you're you're trying to be more human, more human as a as a leader. You know, to tap to um, tap into um, who you really are. Well, I mean, yes. And then as I listen to the words and I'm you know reflect on what I've just said, this is why this conversation I, I'm very thoughtful about it in regards to how I communicate with other business leaders because it sounds trite. You know, you know I want to as a leader, I want to be more human. Well, you, well, you, you're human now. What are you talking about? So. Mm. It's just, um, and this is why it's, language is, is important that we don't turn people off this. This is, you know, this is just um, mm. uh, fluff or this is just a uh, conversation that doesn't really have any grounding in the day-to-day of, you know, my business. Well, um, that, might, that might be true. Uh, and, and I have to say also I live in the, the cloistered tech world, right? So uh, let me also acknowledge that. But I just think for leadership to be truly effective it has to start from a, a grounding of truth and 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 safety that you can actually just be who you are good bad and indifferent right because again we're all imperfect i think as a leader that's uh i think that's crucial because that's what attracts people i think in the end i don't know it's been my, it's what i'm attracted to in a leader and so um and to, to the extent that that's that's true for others then uh, maybe there's something in it what, what advice would you give to the future leaders? So people who are coming through, coming now, aspiring to, um, to lead a business, aspiring to do, to do your role at some point, what, what, what guidance would you, um, would you, would you give them? Um, I hesitate because that's, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, and, and in that same breath, it's um, being clear on your purpose. So Simon Sinek talks a lot about this um, at Microsoft. We have a uh, partnership with a, a guy called Dr. Mike Gervais, uh, who's been really helpful for me. There are many who talk about this. Brené Brown does as well, with lots of speakers and thought leaders. But I think the answer, Lawrence, is just be clear on your purpose. So if you boil it all down, and I'm not talking about work, I'm talking about you, know, you the human. Uh, why, why are you here? What are you trying to achieve? What's what's vital? And not not an essay, you know. It could be it's one sentence or it's one thought or it's um, for me it's 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 just clarity on the things that are important because that this is back to this idea of being authentic. Then if you know if you're clear on exactly what you're trying to achieve and it's easy to say and hard to do, then um, guess what? Things become a little easier. And then how you're going to react and respond and um, you know how much how much angst will you you take on when things don't go well? Uh, was it really important that that we made that sale, or was it really important that um, you know I delivered that presentation perfectly? Actually, in the scheme of things, no. And and relaxing then, and then saying what's really important is is this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fight for this. I'm gonna live this. This is who I am. This is who I want to be remembered as. You know. Um, uh, that I think would be, and it's not just about you know, leadership. That's about how to live, live well, I think. hundred mm, percent. Well, it's, it's interesting. And I, I think just to kind of add what, to what you said, to what you, what you said is when you're very young, I mean, you think about your own journey and what you know now is very different to what you knew 30 mm. years ago. Um, mm. And we're all on our own journey. And I guess it's having those experiences and learning from those experiences um, and not expecting to be to be perfect. We're, we're almost out of time. Um, the last question I ask um, everybody on this show, because it's called the Finding Equilibrium Show, and the, um, the, 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 um, the under, underlying philosophy is, if we find balance, we find harmony in every situation, then that leads to well-being. So nothing's good, nothing's bad. Perfection is, uh, is something to aspire to. You, you know, that's never going to bring you um, bring you happiness. Um, but what does that mean to you? Like, what does finding equilibrium mean to you? I'd have asked you this a, a few years ago. And then the, the second part of that question is, how do you support yourself? And it may well have changed in terms of supporting yourself to be in equilibrium um, every day because you've got a lot of responsibility, a lot of people who are dependent on you. Um, and, I, I, and, and we've talked about this throughout, but leadership well-being is, is, is key because uh, leadership behavior has a big impact on, on, on well-being, whether it's um, co- co- colleagues or communities. Um, 
So I'm curious what um, what you do and what world, what finding equilibrium means to you. I came I came across this quote a little while ago um, that that stuck with me, and I'll, I'll um, let me just read it. It's by Pablo Neruda, who I I must admit I don't know. Anyway, um, I'll credit him. Uh, and, and it's three lines. In the end, everyone is aware of this. Nobody keeps any of what he has, and life is only a borrowing of bones. Um, and so um, I, I quite quite enjoyed uh, that when I read it because it um, it reminds reminds me of the um, intransience of life and our experience. Um, we're here for a very short time when you when you stand back. Um, I reflect on, I think the last time we spoke, we, uh, I was talking about one of you know, the big moments in my life of learning was when the passing of my parents. And uh, there's, there's moments where you sort of become very aware of uh, just how uh, fragile it all is. And, and, and then as a result, you reflect on, so why am I so worried about um, the, my coffee was too hot or too cold or my breakfast was late or whatever, uh, you know, the flight was delayed. And, and I, I get as agitated by any of those things as, as, as uh, most people. But um, I think just what does it mean, finding equilibrium? Just connecting more often um, with your inner, inner self, your real self, who, who you are. And when you, when you actually find that time, um, you find that there's a sense of peace that is there. And it could be, could be anywhere, any moment. We can, we can have that sense of peace and calm and equilibrium and getting to that place more often is you know my my goal or my aspiration um and there are lots of techniques uh that are as imperfect as they are that help whether it's physical health or again the mental disciplines um uh you know spending time with friends there are lots of techniques there but i think being just being more often Lawrence, not rushing not uh, not clinging not, not aspiring not rushing not trying to achieve something it's just you know, enjoying this 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 precious life that we have because it it's um it's over before we know it. Very very true, beautiful words and at the perfect place to to stop. So Stephen, let me acknowledge you for all the work that you've done, do continue to do, and thank you again for coming on to the show today and sharing your your knowledge and your wisdom and your insight. Thank you so much and. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for your time, for your attention, and uh, we will see you very soon. You take care now.